darkness in the way that there is a way out to the sea, but it's, yeah, you know, but it's, it's intersected with canals, canals and dams. yeah, and dams mm-hmm. and things. So you'd have to have I a... I posted videos in my champ groups last night showing boats, all the crap they have to go through to get in and out of the, the, the canal systems. So mm-hmm. to think some monster could go in and out of that is ridiculous. This is landlocked. I understand. It really is. Yeah, yeah. Whereas with the Loch Ness situation, I mean, there's... The with, river with the, is fairly shallow when it goes right through the middle of Inverness, where it's uh, a bridge that people could see the monster, but I don't know. It's not... It's impossible. the western direction or the southwestern direction I'm thinking of more, because when I walked uh, from Fort Augustus at the bottom of Loch Ness, I walked up to, to Loch Oich via the river Oich. Look, you've got all them canals. Yes, mm. but the Caledonian Canal runs through the center, and then at the side, the rivers run. So well, there, are, there are all there are, there are better ways into the other uh, lochs like Loch Lochy, Loch Oich, Loch Gary, which I thought would be perhaps Why not a little just have hideout it on the bottom of eight hundred feet of water. That but that hot. that also works. But um, I mean, they're already and, there, and there's no nothing to get around except well, breathing. Well, well, we do have a lot of and that uh, solves salt that water. problem. Mm. Absolutely. Right. And there is, of course, a lot of saltwater life that we already have well documented that goes into these locks sometimes, like seals are um, yeah. relatively common inside Loch Ness. Not, you know, terribly often, but it, it's yeah. known to happen pretty well. But people so that's, see them and know them for what they are. Mm. And I think what Carrick's saying is that, uh, you know, as a, a, a sea bound animal does make its way into the loch. Yeah. Know, these, these An amphibious do. one. Mm, exactly. Right, but they crawl around so it, mm, right. But then they would come up the river ness and be less noticeable due to their size, or they would be seen moving up the river ness. Well, remember I think what Steve um, Steve Felton said about the seals, mm. about how you could see them in the winter, but yeah. it was hard to see them in the summer. So I don't know. You know? Mm. That's interesting. I hadn't heard about that. Yeah. So an interview hmm. Andy did with him. Yeah, I mean, he's been there. I, it's shocking, really. I've never really gotten to speak to Steve very often since I became um, tied to this <laughs> interest, uh, like publicly right. tied to the interest instead of just privately. And you know what? What a nice guy. What a level-headed, great guy who just, you can see in his bearing that this is a person that spent many years quietly watching, watching and waiting and looking for something I mean, we have jobs, you have your lives, you don't live in Champlain anymore, uh, Scott and Carrick, you don't live on location, wherever yeah, you're looking yeah. for the cryptid. I definitely don't, I live outside of London. Mm. Um, there's lots of monsters here, but none of them cryptids. Right. And, um, <laughs> yeah, so we don't live in that, and you've done it, Scott, for a long time, but I always wonder what happens. Yeah. This seems That life seems to break so many people. They become alcoholics, or they become depressives, or they become crazy. Mm. Um, just watch well, I know it. one Wait. that's headed in that direction right now. I'm not going to mention her name, but mm. she's headed that way. Mm. It's not well, uh, Diane Fossey by any chance. Yeah. <laughs> Dennis has already uh, gone down the rabbit hole. Yeah, he's off the radar. We have, we don't even know what happened to um, Liz von Muggenthaler. That was one thing I found that was really interesting that I wish I could have given some kind of answer for throughout filming Release the Baudette film was everyone who I talked to who uh, had talked with her or who knew her personally, like you, Scott, or like Ruby Anderson or Chuck Pogan, yeah. anybody said, uh, yeah, we have no idea where she went. We don't know yeah, what happened to the copy of the Baudette dead, but she's yeah, no, MIA. No, she, that there's no missing persons report, I don't think, yeah. as far as we're, so she's not dead and she's not missing. She's simply dropped off of yeah. the, the, um, where she's gone. Nobody really knows. It seems like sometimes that seems like that's happened roughly twice at Lake Champlain. That happened with Liv Muggenthaler, and to a lesser extent, like you mentioned, Scott, that happened with Dennis Hall. Um, we know he still lives around Lake Champlain. We actually saw him while filming Waste the Woodhead film. Didn't talk to him, but just you know saw him doing his own thing in his yard, and um. It, it just seems like it's kind of this weird, uh, either gradual or very sudden blip off the radar. And then who knows if they're ever coming back to it. Um, yeah. I suppose to some degree it might make sense why someone like Dennis Hall left, because Dennis Hall was a very controversial figure. Mm-hmm. Um, Liz wasn't very controversial. 
you know, she was pretty straightforward with most of her stuff. So um, it really, you know, the biggest question that I got out of Lisa Bonnet film is where the hell is Liz von Muckenthaler? Because she is an important player in all of this. And uh, I wish I had some kind of answer, but there isn't one. Wow. The, the way I, I heard it, there was, there was, was a... I'm the steward of the, her data. Mm. Mm, right. So, you know, I'm the only one left around the... You know, because I co-authored the abstract, mm. I've sort of inherited part of it. What's right. your opinion today on that, Scott, that on the echolocation? Yeah. What's that? What 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 are your feelings now, in, in hindsight, on the echolocation, on the data that you collected? Well, the thing is, you have to understand, there are two components of the echolocation data. There's the audible portion, and then there's a, a part of the signal that goes up beyond the range of human hearing mm -hmm. that is not registered on the tape you hear, but is registered on the sonar graph uh -huh. that accompanied right. the original recording. Right. So the evidence that it is location, echolocation is the ultrasonic part of the signal. Mm. That's on the, the sonograph. You right. can't hear it with the naked ear, but it's there. Mm. Wow. According to the graph. So that's what makes it echolocation. The audible portion sounds like audio recordings of whales echolocating, but it also sounds like fish releasing gas. Mm -hmm. So the audible portion is ambiguous. Mm. It's the ultrasonic portion of the signal that makes it possibly echolocation. That's the important part of the data. So that's one reason why it's so important for us when we go back to try to get new echolocation sounds that we have some method of recording the ultrasonic part of it. Mm -hmm. Because without that, you know, it's... It's not well, it, it's it's ambiguous and exactly. uh, without that now i think yeah so it's, it's very important for us to be able to record somehow mm. the ultrasonic portion of these sounds otherwise been, we're just messing around you know has mm. it been attempted since uh yourself and elizabeth tried to uh, uh, capture these sounds well has anybody else attempted it and had that ultrasonic a component in the I was sitting with her in 2009 when we recorded new ones. Wow. Mm. And we talk about that in the abstract. Mm. Right. We recorded sounds originally in 2003, then went back in 2005. By the time she went back in 2009 to get the last ones, I was with her. Mm. We published the abstract in 2010. We've got several draft versions of a full paper, but I can't do anything with it mm. unless Liz signs off on it. So I'm sitting on uh, it. Right. There is a full paper. <laughs> what a shame. So much in yeah. Lake Monster law and Lake Monster evidence is tied up and held in other hands. I, I, I think I, I think you played it to me once. I, I've, I've heard yeah. a sample that you sent me. Uh, that, the device I was using wasn't particularly uh, Are we all high recording? tech. Yes, yes, we are. Yes, yeah, oh, we're okay. absolutely. Yes, I, wasn't, yeah. I wasn't sure. So. I'm so sorry. I never give any warning. No, I just, that's just, fine. Just, yeah, I just, just get going. I, I, I mean, this is great stuff. I don't want to lose it. You know. No, no, and also, um, somebody else asked me that. I had to edit out a portion of somebody else's interview because um, we delved into a sensitive subject that shouldn't have been aired early in the recording and he said were well, you recording that i said well yeah i just press record and we go and because then if you don't <laughs> well, know yeah. you just start I know, speaking I and to make sure you were recording absolutely, point. <laughs> absolutely. You know, every conversation, conversation we've had to start and um but scott i think that, that you know you've been there for so long and uh, i've only had a, a little glimpse at that area and carrick you've recently investigated one of the many mysteries of the area and What's amazing to me, Lake Monster Law and Loch Ness is really uh, a very typical uh, um, location for this, is how much evidence there is out there that seems to be held in other hands 
or is missing or uh, similarly with you scott with the with uh, elizabeth von muggenthaler's um, research is is missing a person who is actually missing to sign off on you publishing it's well, you know, God forbid something should happen to Liz, but if it mm. does, I will go ahead and, and publish right. the it's paper amazing. posthumously. I, I hope she she turns up because I not only it. is she my research colleague, she's my friend too. So you know, yeah, and that wait she's, and see okay. what happens. Liz, if you're out there, please do get in touch. We we would love to publish. We've that done paper. everything we could, short of hiring a yeah. private detective, which none yeah. of us can afford. So. Right, yeah. of course. Yeah. That's um that's very that's a shame. Karen, what about your foray into this this world recently with the the Baudet film? Hmm. Yeah, it's it's kind of an interesting subject. One thing that we dealt a lot with during was the Baudet film that's kind of along these same lines is the uh, the lack of an ability to really uh thoroughly get something documented inside that film unfortunately inside the documentary i should say and the Bonnet film was fine with that you know it's, mm. i expected that i wouldn't talk to shagan or that i wouldn't talk to uh you know any you know i wouldn't talk to Bonnet, i wouldn't talk to affalter i tried contacting all of them but no responses um i do mention of course that i i was able to contact melanie stiasini who is the curator of fishers at the american national history museum mm. and um she uh declined the interview, which was uh, all that I could really say in the documentary. Of course, I can't go into detail what the emails actually were. But that was kind of the first bit of that was, um, you know, the story is not lining up with the article. She she claimed to have not seen it, which is, you know, fair enough. Maybe she didn't. The article was wrong, mm -hmm. but it's a piece of inconsistency. And like the hall fragment, another example, that is a really interesting piece of debris. And uh, everyone I've showed that, Scott, the first thing they say is, is that a bone? Like, that looks like a bone. It doesn't necessarily look just like wood, although it obviously could be wood or it could be stone. Um, but that's everyone's first thought is it looks like it's bone. And that thing has, by all accounts, dissolved at this point. So we have no way to actually chemically test that object. Mm -hmm. um, with the, the Kingsland Bay tracks, we can't say who took the photos. We can't say what paper they were in. We can't even show the original photographs. All we had was an anonymous artist who had seen the photographs who kindly recreated them for us. Um, unfortunately, that's all we had to work with. So a lot of times we came up uh, with the kind of, I guess you could say, Baudet-esque problem mm -hmm. of not having the full story to present in this documentary, which would make things a little challenging sometimes. Um, you know, analysis of the Baudet film, this is the first really, uh, I would say, kind of specific, albeit immature, or amateur, sorry, anatomical analysis um, on the Baudet film in a documentary that I've seen so far. Mm -hmm. Um I wasn't able to find an image, unfortunately, but one thing I found quite interesting, I, I mentioned in this documentary that this uh, this head-like object has towards the side of it this kind of circular image. Mm -hmm. And it reminded me greatly, and what's so interesting, uh, Pogan Anderson, what I find quite interesting, is it looks very much like those circular sides of turtle heads that you have, especially uh, long, long like turtles yeah. have this kind of ovular pad of skin right around this area. And it looked quite similar. But, of course, you also have this relatively triangle-shaped head, which is something more kind of plesiosaur-esque about it. Um, Scott and I have both pointed out the uh, the things that look kind of like nares at the end of the face. And uh, luckily, that was actually quite visible through enhancing it, although the pads were kind of harder to see. And, uh, yeah, I mean, the whole project ran into that a lot. So, in a way, it was it was kind of a uh, a creative exercise, as as much as it was a documentation of information. I think it, it's just it's just really fascinating. I mean, this is an area you've been in for so long because you must have poured over that that footage so many times. And, and I know I have, and you obviously have recently, Carrick, to make the film. But it's it's always astonishing to me that somewhere out there, somebody has possibly groundbreaking footage that could, if they have a financial interest in holding it, that could make them a lot of money, and yet they don't show it and i always wonder what that is why would this person get um uh, get hold of this footage or buy this footage and then say well i just don't want anybody to see it that's the psychological aspect of it, it doesn't make sense it doesn't seem to match human nature um 
they, it did hit the news. There clearly is some sort of profit to be made in releasing the film, at least initially, and showing it again in full to well, all of made the... no money on it in 15 years, so exactly. I don't understand what their strategy is. It's yeah. not... Whatever it is, it's not working. If yeah. They're trying, yeah. trying to make money off of it. It's not working. So, and how much, how much do they want for the footage? Well, the I know for a fact they've been off of $40,000... Wow. Wouldn't take that, which is a ridiculous sum, if you ask wow. me. <laughs> the anonymous witness that we have at the end of the documentary yeah. uh, claims to have offered them between 10000 and 20000 and were laughed out of the room, essentially. Wow. Um, when Alexander Petikov was making his Maltime Monster series on the Trail of Champ, he contacted Shagan and was actually in contact with him. And uh, at the point that Alexander said, well, I don't have a whole lot of money, could I borrow maybe a frame or two for this? Uh, just never got any response after that. So this is a, a very, you know, um, cut and dry situation. No money, no video, which is the point of the documentary is to, uh, is that's the thing I want to point out actually to people maybe who are watching this, who haven't seen the documentary yet. Yeah. The documentary does not include the full footage. That's one thing I've seen that's kind of been uh, misconstrued online mm. is that the documentary unveils the full footage. It's meant to make people more aware of the Bodette mm. film. And, and hopefully that will put some public pressure, although I can't imagine it will do too much, unfortunately, but maybe it will. Maybe it's just enough for Shaken to think, you know what, it has been 15 years. It'll probably be 20 years before I know it, and yeah. I'm not going to make money on this thing. I might as well give it up. Um, either it's a hoax or it's not. And if it's not, maybe there's yeah. some kind of quality to be appealed to. Like we mentioned in the documentary, under the American Endangered Species Act – there are types of emergencies that can be declared for wildlife mm -hmm. if there is sufficient evidence for that emergency. Uh -huh. This might be that sufficient evidence for some scientists, and that might be enough. Um, That's it probably, the question. It, is anybody going to be brave enough to step forward and take a chance to say, well, this might be a real animal? Yeah. And to right. move forward in that direction. Yeah. You know, you got to think. There's a lot of scientists that are leery of getting involved with something cryptozoology mm. related. And I believe part of it goes back to the fact that Dennis Tucker was fired from his job mm. at the London Museum of Natural History over the Loch Ness Monster. That's right. Yeah. I happen to think, yeah. I have no firm proof, but I believe that's what made Maurice Burton mm. do an about face from being a Nessie advocate to being a Nessie skeptic as he was worried about his reputation. Mm. I think I think that's a, something a lot of people don't take into consideration. And I've been accused in the past of trying to, you know, just by randoms on the internet, or you were just trying to profiteer from cryptozoology. And I, I've always responded to them, what kind of cryptozoology are you talking about where there's profit <laughs> available and involved? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if, if, if it's about money, then I'm running at a steep deficit at the moment. And um, if it was a business, I would, it, yeah, it would be, it would already be filed for bankruptcy. It's not one of those um, industries. And those yeah. guys at the top of this who do make a little money here and there, well, they've been there a long time and they, they, they push hard to, to make it their career so they can dedicate you know, their whole lives to that and, and that research. Most people, like the rest of us, have other lives and other jobs, and that's just what we have to do. So, you know, a Carrick or a Scott or an Andy can't pay £50,000 for some interesting footage in the I hope know, that I it's going to turn out to be... You know? well, right. I, I think if I had, because I would be hard-pushed to spend that kind of money. Way, the easiest the way to deal with this situation is to take Shagan out of the equation. Yeah. And buy the video, then you can do what you whatever you want with with it right. without having to worry about him getting in the way or Bodette or a Falter or anybody else. Right. People have mentioned fundraisers too. And yeah, who knows? Well, we maybe this will be the way forward that. with this. Um, we really should look into that. Yeah. Yeah, that might be the only way that we ever get to see this thing. Um, yeah. but say we, we raise a hundred grand. And then we we go to Shagan and, and say, okay, here's a hundred grand. It says, well, now I want two hundred grand. You know, it's just it's insane. Yeah. Who knows? No, no TV station would pay that kind of money for that footage. No. Nobody would pay that money for the footage. Yeah, probably they might give him if it was a big scoop, a few thousand. The Fulton, um, but they probably got a reasonable little payoff when they first shared the footage. Well, the I would love station. to see it, but I do know. Personally, I've known three people that have seen the full video. Wow. Mm. 
And what have they said about the full video? Well, one of them was Will Draganis. We actually quote him in the documentary. Mm, we do. Liz Which saw it. Yeah. Liz saw it, and Ruby talks about that in the documentary. Mm. And the anonymous eyewitness, whose name I can't give you, but I know him too. Yeah. And all three of them have said that there was a seal-like head that come above the surface of the water. Okay. That you don't see on the ABC clip. Okay. Right. You know what's interesting is um, Ruby, the reason I, I put her and Chuck Pogan's uh, interviews together in the documentary is because they both have very similar ideas about the Champ and the Bodette film. Ruby particularly says that she was watching it with her um, her daughter and her stepson, I think it was. And uh, she said, well, the, the head and neck looks really weird, but behind it there's this strange object too, and it really – Reminds me of a carapace of some kind, a shell. Mm -hmm. And um, Ruby said that one of the last times that she talked to Liz von Mogenthaler was about the Baudet film before she kind of dropped off the radar. And that Liz uh, and her had conversed about the whole turtle theory. And that Liz said that on some of the things about the Baudet film, Ruby was spot on. So, um, you know, Liz's is probably the most interesting thing that we haven't heard yet, her testimony on this. Because it sounds like she was uh, just really serious about this being an important film and you know maybe what maybe what she's doing right now is is trying to get that out i don't know um yeah it's a weird situation with with the whole footage it's it's a shame that so few people have been able to see it mm. um one part that was uh unfortunately the audio was a little bit too poor for this segment but the anonymous eyewitness had talked about um wanting to write a, a book or an article about the Budette film and apparently had been told uh, in a verbal contract that they would be able to grab any still that they wanted from the film, just one still. Uh, and then when they signed their disclosure agreement, which is why we have them as anonymous, that was not part of the agreement. So there, there is a bit of um, something's up with this, mm. as far as I can sure. tell. Something's a little bit askew in the legal department with this. And I think that that's an important thing to raise, because we can talk all the live long day about how this might be morally incorrect. Mm. But uh, I think that there's something to be said for how this might even be legally incorrect. Um, you know, there might be some shady contracts going on, and there might be a violation of the Endangered Species Act going on here. So... I mean, that's pretty uh, significant stuff. I would imagine that the if it was at all possible, and you could do it really well, uh, especially with the, the resurgence, uh, post-COVID resurgence of tourism to the area, you could do it in line with a, with a push for tourism that the Endangered Species Act steps in to provide mm. some sort of, or obtain some evidence of the animal in order to protect it. So there could be a... I suppose a dual, you could use the tourism push to get the Endangered well, Species Act pushed the onto this to say, we need that footage. Thing done by Ryans and Scott back in 1975 was the attempt to get Nessie protected. Mm -hmm. It was their main motivation behind that. Yeah. Right. You see how that turned out, so. Well, I since know. then, I mean, since then, what they've actually stated is, the Scottish government has stated is the, the current um, the current act that we have in place in the UK would automatically protect this animal were it to be discovered. Mm. So it That's would include... It hasn't been it would, discovered, technically. It right. hasn't, but were it to be discovered, the act that we already have in place for other wildlife would also cover it. That's the way they, they view it when they were asked. Wow. And nothing else needs to be enacted because it wouldn't be hunted, it wouldn't be endangered. The The... I forget what the act is called now. Actually, it's the. Um, I'll find that. I'll put it in the in the link below. Um, anyway, the act that we have would automatically inculcate Nessie, should it be a real creature, into right. its um, into its protection, and that's great. That's wonderful. We have an act like that that can be adapted mm. so I readily. Believe, I believe if Nessie has ever discovered that the Nesiteris rhombopteryx name has precedent. Mm. Being the name of the new species. That would be fantastic. That would yeah, be fantastic. That, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Why can't we get, I mean, maybe it's a, a bit pointless to uh, say this, but why can't we have a Rhines again, you know, in these days? And maybe the answer to that is we well, have to become a Rhines. 
We're mm, trying no, to move um, in that direction. Right. Yeah, that's right. what I'm saying. Maybe that's that's the answer. In fact, I'm seeking. I've been meaning to suggest to the guys in the, the new group we've got that we set up some kind of a floating platform with cameras and sonar and all that stuff based on the model that Ryan's was using mm. in the mid 1970s. Right. But with updated technology. But we mm. gotta sit down and really think about this and get mm. the pieces put together and all that stuff. But right. I think that's the route to go. There's some real equipment out there that you could use yeah. these days. They could be almost autonomous, I would imagine. Well, there's, there's even portable environmental mm. DNA labs now, but they're, they yeah. cost an right. arm and a leg. Yes, you know, exactly. We know the technology we need, it's just being able to afford it. Well, look at what Neil Gemmell had to go through, essentially, to get his eDNA off the ground. He had to come yeah. and visit the monster, pretend to look for it, um, and... It, not that he wouldn't have been happy to find it, of course, but mm. essentially, this was the funding, you know, for his big eDNA yep. project. Yep. What would it have been without that? You know, it was it was a great publicity maybe if we coup. can maybe if we can get lucky enough, working with the tools that we have to find something intriguing enough to get somebody's attention, we might be able to get funding in the future. But we've got we're not there yet. We've got to find something significant first. Mm. Right, and I think that's the importance of talking about things like the Baudet film in a way that can intrigue scientists, too. Um, the documentary could have easily been, wouldn't it be cool to see a sea monster? Mm. It could have easily been that. But, you know, I don't think that's the scientific significance of the Baudet film. I think the scientific significance is, well, who wants to be clowned on for two, you know, upwards of $100,000? I certainly don't want to, so let's not pay 2000 to 20000 whatever he wants for this footage if it is fake. Um, and if it's not fake, we have to consider that there is some real th – that's why I loved focusing on the lesser known pieces of evidence like the Kinsling traps. And, well, those were a bit debunked, I suppose, but more like the Hall fragment or uh, Martis's sonar is – there is some really – tantalizing evidence that there is something happening in Lake Champlain and that doesn't mean that there's necessarily a lake monster in the Baudet film but there's something interesting in the Baudet film and if we're going to be serious about conservation efforts the last thing that we would want to do is to say oh you know bah humbug to that whatever and then find a fossil of this thing you know let's say 200 years down the road when they've been there long enough to start forming fossils and realized that we completely missed the chance to find a live specimen. Well, you know, I think one thing we need to be doing, we've got Jeremy and Ryan to dive for us. Mm. We need to be going to the places that are likely to have caves based on the geology and look for bones inside of these possible underwater caves. And also we need to be looking in the floors of these caves that are above ground, above water now. Mm. There could be bones in the in the clay at the bottom of these caves. Mm. I mean, I know of three right now that we could be looking in the bottoms of those that are above water now. So, right. you know, even if we found a bone of something unidentified from the time of the Champlain Sea, that would still be a step in the right direction. Absolutely. That's one thing I was thinking of earlier when we were talking about echolocation uh, that is just so interesting is, isn't it just so on a purely even just, you know, leave cryptozoology out of it for a second. It is so scientifically interesting to me, and it should be, I think, to scientists in general, that in a lake, a freshwater lake, where we have evidence of cetacean presence when it was still open to the ocean, something that at the time was quite unprecedented and totally changed our paradigm for this lake, we have cetacean-like echolocation. Mm -hmm. You know, that's pretty interesting. It doesn't mean that we have cetaceans in the lake, but that is just another piece of, wow, this might be the most just geographically unique body of water in North America. It might be it. And it's, it's certainly top of the list. And, I mean, if that's the case, why isn't it being looked into more already? You know, we're, instead we're dumping a lot of sewage into the lake. We're not um, doing a good job of keeping the sturgeons alive. 
that was one thing that we talked about in the Buddha film uh, documentary, especially with Jeremy Sanborn's interview. He he brings up such a good point about conservation laws and says, you know, protecting camp, champ is just fine. But if we're going to protect champ, we need to protect what champ eats, what champ eats, eats, and so on down the food chain. Because yeah. that is such a fragile ecosystem that one break sends ripples throughout the entire line. And yeah. If this is an endangered large animal that's already seen this rarely, especially if it has amphibious traits like a lot of sightings suggest, it might require oxygen, obviously. So if we're seeing them this little already, maybe there's not that many of them left. And if there's not many of them left, a significant break in the food chain might be the thing that does a species like that in. And, uh, you know, for all we know, we're running out of time. And if there is no monster then we need to the investigation still has a very immediate prevalence because if there is no lake monster we need to stop putting resources into looking for a lake monster yes. and put resources into figuring out why the hell are so many honest people seeing lake monsters or are convinced they're seeing lake monsters up close what's the echolocation what was the hull fragment what are these photos actually of what's in the bodette video that's still an investigation just an entirely different one and so you know there's a prevalence to get this sorted out there really is yeah it's like the analogy of the three blind men studying the elephant and they're touching different parts of it mm -hmm. and they don't know if they're touching three different objects that they assume are interrelated or connected or different parts of one larger object and they haven't figured out how to put all the pieces together yet. Exactly. Yeah. I think that, yeah. I think that's a fantastic analogy. One of the things we, we rarely take into consideration as well when looking in a location for a lake monster is those correlative, corroborative sightings around the world in other lakes, similar bodies of water, with similar descriptions, seen by uh, similarly credible people or credulous people who are standing by what they've seen but can't unsee it. And it always amazed me that we talk about Loch Ness or Lake Champlain or Lake Okanagan, and yet we don't match all of those together and say, what is the what is the photo fit? You know, what is the artist's impression of this creature that all of these different unconnected witnesses are seeing, have been seeing? over millennia in some cases, and try to put something together and say, what is this exactly? What is the most common description in all of these locations? Hmm. Well, that's why I talk about, when I talk about Champ, I also talk about the evidence from Loch Ness and the hmm. Zia Maru carcass, hmm. the Alvin submersible encounter, and the Valhalla hmm. monster, because it's all kind of interconnected. Hmm. It is. It really is. It really is. And you've got the reworked fossils and all this stuff. You know, you've got several different lines of evidence coming from different areas mm. that can be kind of piled together and say, well, this is what I think is going on. Mm. Yeah. yeah, it was interesting. Um, I researched a bit of that, although not as much as Scott already knows, for one of Scott's interviews in the documentary. We're talking about the Hall Fragment. And he mentions a Scandinavian petroglyph of a horned serpent. And what was so interesting is that the horns on this horned serpent uh, weren't like the ones you find in, like, uh, the the southwestern uh, United States, mm -hmm. for example. They have these very long ram-like horns. Uh, this thing had a very kind of curved triangular horn and uh, one that kind of doesn't even, like, poke out. It kind of just kind of rides upwards mm -hmm. a bit. This is uh, the Nova Scotia petroglyph, right? Yeah, and... Yeah, what it's I an thought... Indian petroglyph. It's a Micmac Indian petroglyph in Nova Scotia. Right. And what I thought was so interesting about that was that is exactly, for the most part at least, the horns that we find on prehistoric large reptiles. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the kind of horn you see on Ceratosuchus, for example. Ceratosuchus is mentioned in the, uh, the documentary, this horned alligator. And, um, you know, there are several varieties of other horned animals that have exactly this kind of crest-like horn. Mm. And, you know, that was so interesting to me because I can't think of a single animal that they would have seen that would have said, yes, that's what a horn should look like. Mm. You know, that's that's really strange to be that specific. Um, even on snakes, most of the horned snakes don't have that. They have these actually really vertical mm. horns. You see the documentary, too, when talking about the snake theory, 
uh, you know, horned snakes are pretty devil horned horned, whereas this was very prehistoric reptile looking, which is really interesting. Mm. And that was one point of the documentary was to cover kind of most, if not all of the bases for the theories about champ. Uh, we talk about invertebrates a bit. We talk about uh, the Tanistrophius theory, which is kind of one that was prevalent a while ago and, and is dropping mm. back off now. Um, we talked about the giant snake theory, which is always really interesting. And, of course, the plesiosaur theory, which which tends to be the one that fits it the most anatomically speaking, aside from maybe a long-necked turtle, which is almost identical to a plesiosaur in many respects. As mm. a very baseline image, it looks like a shelled plesiosaur, essentially. Um, so it's it's very uh, difficult to discern what people might be seeing when they describe different things. Seal-like head. That could mean giant seal, or it could mean a thing that vaguely resembles a seal, which plesiosaurs do, which some it's turtles... people do. pulling an image out of their comparative library in their yeah. head. Which yeah. animal do I know that a represents a seal? Mm. Yeah. Very yeah, similar exactly. animals. Yeah. I remember I, a I lot. think you're right. I, I remember looking at the Loch Ness, the old Loch Ness sightings, or the, the, um, the water horse sightings from a long time ago, and it's always, it had an eel-like head, a dog-like head, a seal-like head, a sheep-like head, local mm. animals, usually, things that they would recognize. And you say, okay, mm. within that, there was a semblance there was of the a way that the animal sore, looked. There's a plesiosaur from Morocco that has a face like a cat, believe mm. it or not. Called Zarafasara. Right. Yeah, it's got a skull and face. It looks like a cat. Mm. And there must have been some significant variation. And you would imagine if they are spread all over the world, these creatures, whether they be uh, forms of a species of plesiosaur or other some other unknown animal, I always think of the you know the bear theory. You know, when you have different descriptions of bears, well, you know, a polar bear, a panda, a black bear, a moon yeah. bear, a grizzly bear, they all look like bears, and that they all look very different. And you identify them as bears. However, well, you look at the you look at the fossil record of plesiosaurs; they've mm. been found everywhere: mm. the North Pole, the South Pole, any country right. you can name mm. with Mesozoic fossil deposits. Plesiosaurs have been found. Yeah. Exactly. That was one thing. We're a whole suborder of reptiles mm. Mm. with much biodiversity. You have ones that were five feet long. You have ones that were almost fifty feet long. Mm -hmm. Some had necks twice the length of their bodies. Some had only thirteen vertebrae with giant heads. Mm. Right. And there were all sorts of grades in between. I put together a montage one time that showed I remember it. a complete series of, of intermediate forms going mm. from a large-headed plyosaur to the longest neck elasmosaur. Mm. And there were types all the way in between with different neck lengths and different head sizes. Some of them, their bodies were, were different shapes. Some of them had triangular bodies in cross-section, and other ones had flat ones, round bodies. So there was a, quite a bit of biodiversity there. And that would make sense. That would make sense. We see that in all animals you know, that have a multiplicity of, of species. It, that's just yeah. a normal thing. You know, where they've adapted to the particular environments they were in or the, the yep. food there stuff that ones, they ate. There were ones that lived in fresh water mm. their whole life. There were ones that could go back and forth between the two environments. There were ones that lived in tropical environments. You know, so right. there was quite a bit of biodiversity there. Mm -hmm. Dietary That's differences, all sorts of things. So they, yeah. were, they were, were not just a species or genus of reptile. They were a whole order or suborder of reptiles. Mm. Now, and I know that you're... We're not even sure that they are reptiles in what we consider a reptile sense today. I mean... Mm. Dinosaurs are technically reptiles, but they were warm-blooded. They walked upright on two legs. They're not what we would consider a reptile today. Right. In what we normally assume a reptile is looking at a lizard or a crocodile. So mm -hmm. technically, plesiosaurs were reptiles, but what is a reptile? I mean, 
our ancestors were technically reptiles too. Mm. Now they're called synapses. Right, what's right. flying mammal between reptile reptiles. and mammal goes is blurred. Mm. So you look at something like Demetrodon, which looks like a lizard with a frill on its back, and now they tell you, no, that's not a reptile, that's a synapsid. Right. So, you know, uh, is a chicken a reptile? Mm. Yes, no. Yeah, that's one big question is ever since we kind of uh, realized that birds were the last uh, evolutionary descendants of the theropod dinosaurs, we have the question, are birds really birds or are we just looking at a different kind of flying reptile? Um, and that's, you know, that's a good kind of question. Where does the line get drawn with that? One thing that well, gets talked about a lot with the turtle theory is how adaptable turtles can be with moving into yeah. northern environments, these colder lakes. And that is just as viable as the plesiosaur theory in that respect, because plesiosaurs, you had a plesiosaur at essentially every corner of the world when they were plesiosaurs. Yeah. And they well, were cold water with ice. Yeah, they were. You, you mentioned um, colder water temperatures than Loch Ness and Lake Champlain get today. Mm hmm. We know leatherbacks can survive in those water temperatures. Right. And there's evidence that plesiosaurs may have been even more warm-blooded than a leatherback turtle. Mm. Yeah, right, right, right. Well, that is one of the big events of plesiosaurs right now. Yeah. They, they think their thermal physiology probably fell somewhere between a leatherback turtle and a bird. Mm. So, look at penguins. Yeah, right. Right, right, right. Scott, talking about um, this corroboration with lake monsters, sea monsters, river monsters all around the world, going on the pleasure triangle for a little longer as well, you live officially in the land of monsters, Florida, and you've been investigating a few things done there recently, which I always wondered, why, why isn't Scott knee-deep, not literally, of course, as alligators well, say, I, in I the swamps of Florida, looking for these creatures that are purported I to live I literally there. needed some help, and I finally found some people to, to help me do this. Mm. Working with Robbie Antilla, a cryptozoologist and filmmaker out of Tampa, mm. who used to do a uh, YouTube show called Swamp Dog Chronicles. I don't know if mm. you ever remember that show. I've known him for a while. I was a guest on the show twice. Oh, wow. But now he's doing a lot of straight-to-YouTube documentaries, and we're doing one about Florida lake monsters, and we're doing the Lake Clinch monster, which is not very well known, which sounds like some kind of giant snake, possibly a feral uh, python of some kind. And then we're doing the famous St. John's River monster, what they call Pinky. And then we're supposed to finally top that off with an expedition to Altamaha River to look for Al. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Oh, Georgia. wow. So that's supposed to be coming up in January. But I'm supposed to go to um, Lake Monroe, which is a portion of the St. John's River, on Tuesday to do some more filming. We've already filmed several segments. We filmed a segment at Lake Clinch. And we went to this place called Dinosaur World in mm. Plant City, Florida, where they have all these giant models of plesiosaurs and sauropod dinosaurs and tanistropheus and all that stuff and recorded some interviews with me talking about the various different types of animals there. Mm. So we're going to be doing some underwater uh, video work at Lake Monroe on Tuesday. And the plan is to rent a boat once we get up to Georgia, and it's possible, it's not confirmed yet, that Jeremy may be coming to Florida in January and may go up there with us and do some diving. Mm. Oh, That's wow. Fantastic. Yeah, so it's looking looking promising. So, what a place to dive. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> really. Um, Just be patient and see what happens. I'm, I'm, well, look, I, I think it's exciting. I... I've only been to Florida once. It was an accident. My plane was was downed in the storm on um, on the way to the U.S. and uh, I ended up in uh, near Orlando, I think, mm. for some reason. 
And I was just astonished, first of all, by by the invisible lady that uh, <laughs> that wiped a hot a hot wet towel in my face when I got off the plane. <laughs> whatever that was. <laughs> it's just like, oh my god, why am I breathing in water, hot water? And um, that was very interesting, muggy, a little bit. And um, but also just to see, even in the hotel, I was in this four star hotel that there was this little pond at back. They called it a pond. It was like a lake, and uh, there was these beware of the alligator signs around the place. There was no fence. There were um, deck chairs going right down to the edge of the pond. And I asked the lady there, I said, oh, so are there alligators in there? She said, well, we haven't seen anybody. You just have to assume there are alligators in every body of water in Florida. That's how you do it. Just assume it's <laughs> they there. Are. They, they could... really are everywhere. And everywhere. You better watch out for them because they are dangerous. <laughs> they are dangerous. And I said, well, there are deck chairs, like, right down to the water's edge. And she said, oh, yeah, well, you know, people like to look at the water. I said, okay, how about a fence or something could consider a wire fence or could it, maybe a 10 foot fence she said no that would really spoil the view i said so i'm gonna go and sit down well, what do i do if if an alligator comes out she said run run as fast as you can and get up a tree absolutely and um i was thinking to myself i scott this is your life so i'm sorry if i'm laughing but i just thought i just sat on this deck chair for maybe two minutes before i lost my nerve i just thought where's the nearest tree and as it shoots out of the water to drag me in, how do I leap up and get up the street? I just thought, anyway, long story short, the point being, you live in a land of actual monsters that we know about already. Yeah. Gigantic pythons that are overtaking the Everglades, alligators in every body of water, possible, you know, herpes infested monkeys roaming the swamps. Well, uh, iguanas, all sorts of messed up stuff. Everything, yeah. everything. Fish jumping out and just smacking you in the face as you're, as you're yep. sailing down the river. Well, what are those? Uh, I forget the name yeah. of the fish. Anyway, and here you are. You know, you've got the Pinky. You've got all these different monsters. The Sanibel Island monster. Yep. Like, awesome. That's not awesome. far away at all. That's like maybe yeah. 70, 80 miles away from me. So this is great. This is like a treasure trove of... of um, well, that's part of the When I go hunting for monsters in Vermont, I'm not yeah. that scared to get in the water. Here I mm. am. Yeah, yeah, of course. Much more cautious about getting in the water. And part of the problem here is you've got so many large animals that we know that live in the water that somebody that is not familiar with these alligators and manatees mm. that lives around here Mm. Maybe a tourist comes down here and sees a manatee hump and thinks he's seen a monster. Mm. Mm. Once you clear all that crap off the table, though, there actually are a lot of sightings of long-necked monsters like your plesiosaur-type creatures here in Florida. Mm. Different areas. There are a lot of sightings up in the panhandle, probably the most famous one being the Pensacola sea monster mm. attack. Let's talk about that. I mean, that's a, yeah. a very I contentious one. I originally did a television program about that mm. for Fox Nation. And, uh, yeah, you know, the story basically relies on the testimony of the one survivor who's dead now. But nobody's ever been able to really poke any real holes in his story. Mm. And at the same time... You've got reports of similar long-necked monsters independent of his report from different areas up and down the panhandle of Florida. Mm. So that adds credibility to his story. So, mm. you know, it it's, comes down to, well, do you find this guy credible or not? So that's all well, you got to work with. Was it confirmed that all of his friends were missing? They were MIA? That The part about the drowning... That's all factual, that you got that confirmed in the newspaper. No bodies recovered? One body was recovered, and that guy is buried in Panama City, Florida. I've actually mm -hmm. got a photograph of his tombstone. Mm -hmm. The other, there were five of them all together. McClory was the only survivor. Brad Rice, his body was found, I think, a week later, washed up on the beach, mm -hmm. wow. with no signs of any attack on him. Mm -hmm. The three other ones were never found. Hmm. Yeah, and so three years after 
the drowning incident, McCleary wrote an article for Fate magazine claiming that they were attacked by a sea monster. Uh huh. So that's the origin of the whole controversy. Okay. okay. But, but the fact that, that they went out to dive on that wreck and that three of them drowned or were missing, it's fact. Nobody disputes that. The only part that's disputed is McCleary's claims about a sea monster. Mm-hmm. Which like seems I strange. Said, you've, got, you've got other reports of people seeing long necked monsters like what McCleary saw in the Florida Panhandle. So we don't have many sightings where active predation or at least an no. attempt to, to kill people is involved. Um, well, you've got to think that this animal lives in the ocean and mm-hmm. has to deal with sharks and other marine predators like an animal that lives in Lake Champlain or Loch Ness mm-hmm. doesn't have to deal with. It's naturally going to be more aggressive. Mm-hmm. And if you startled it, it was supposed that this whole thing took place in a storm. Mm-hmm. This thing could have been confused and, and come in further inland than it normally did and sees these kids and they're panicked anyway. They may have startled it or something. We don't know. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't know. Some people think that McClurry may have just freaked out and hallucinated he was under, under so much stress. So we don't know what really happened. I tend to think that those types of um, waking dream hallucinations are very rare, well, even I, I in stressful situations. Yeah, yeah. When you people say maybe you imagine something, when it's that elaborate, <laughs> either you, you're seriously mentally ill or it was real. You rarely just get yeah. freaked out and well, imagine did, something so descriptive. He was under <laughs> so much stress after this, he had a nervous breakdown, but yeah. he eventually recovered. So. So PTSD, which yeah, could have been from the drowning as well. PTSD yeah. over this incident for the rest of his life. That would make sense. I think I would too. Mm. I know and, uh, his son. Mm. I made friends with his son who lives in uh, Naples. So, personally, I think the guy was telling the truth, at mm. least the truth as far as he believed it. So, I What does know. the son say? Well, he said his father... Suffered from PTSD all his life, and he talked to him about it. His father said it happened. So, yeah. yeah. There's an interview with a son on the same program that I'm on about it. I just think it was always a, an astonishing, you know, sighting to me. There is, um, I don't have it at hand now, to, to, for the actual descriptions, I, I don't know the year, but it's, it's it might be 50s or 60s, maybe later, uh, a tale in the Orkneys, uh, Orkney Islands, of... Um, a young boy sitting on some rocks overhanging the sea in the Orkneys and seeing that the sea suddenly bubble up and a long neck creature reach out and try to grab him from the rocks and he sort of draws himself back and gets away. Oh. And the creature, in a fit of rage, it seems, you know, sort of slaps the waves and you know, uh, uh, disappears beneath yeah. it. But it, his description is that the creature came for him in a predatory manner and tried to pull him off the rocks and and he got away and that to me when I when I first read that I think it's in Paul Harrison's like Monsters and Sea Serpents of the British Isles when I when I first read that I was reminded of the Pensacola Sea Serpents and I thought mm-hmm. yes you know this is yeah. another sign of predation but they're rare they don't seem to be even if people are chased or pursued by these yeah. animals it doesn't ever seem to be in well, you have the St. Columba thing too, but that's extremely rare for Loch Ness. I don't know yes. of any other mm. a, attempt to attack. There's an Irish one. There's an Irish one as well. Um, MacDeeth. Uh, so I have to get this. I'll put everything in the links. I wish I had a few sources up in front of me today. And the, the Anyway, the, the Irish tales of a similar priest um, who actually hears that there's a lake monster in in some lake in Ireland and sends one of his saints across uh, mm-hmm. to test right. that. And the saint is promptly chewed up and sort of killed. Ah. And he allegedly brings mm. the saint back to life or rebukes the creature in some way. But it was it was that story was funny to me because, well, uh, MacDua, maybe his name is MacDua. Anyway, because he sacrifices one of his guys to test out his powers, essentially. Yeah, swim across and the creature will come and 
I'll take care of everything. Don't worry about it. I've got you covered. Um, and it doesn't work out. Uh, could be anything. Could be a gigantic Wells catfish. You know, who, who yeah. knows the situation. Well, anyway, like I was going to say, mm. there are reports of similar long neck creatures being seen in a dune lake called Lake Powell in Destin, Florida. And there's also a sighting from 1943 off Fort Walton, Florida. These are all close by to Pensacola. And then sometime back in the 80s, a guy saw a long neck creature from Pensacola off a bridge. Mm. So, you know, there is a history of independent sightings of creatures like that in the same general area. So I wouldn't dismiss the possibility. Mm. Uh, me neither. I mean, it seems and then viable, most it's of viable the reports, habitat. Most of the reports of Pinky seem to be describing a long neck plesiosaur like creature. Mm. Particularly the, the famous one from 1975 near Jacksonville. There's actually an eyewitness sketch of that one. Mm. And it looks very plesiosaurish. It's even got the, the horn like snorkels on it. Mm. Yeah. What, what, so, what year is that? 1975. Wow. Hmm. Ah, okay. Okay. I've just found this. Uh, I've just found the destroy of the boy in Orkney. Okay. Well, just wait, a, wait and see the documentary when we get it done. It's going to be really cool. We've already hmm. got a lot of cool stuff on it, so. This awesome. will be our first foray into Florida cryptozoology, at least in a concrete form, so. Hmm. Wish me luck. No, I think it'll be amazing. You know, I, I think it'll be absolutely amazing because these are areas, these are creatures that are not being investigated. And everybody's used to Champlain and Loch Ness and Okanagan yeah. and all these well, places. We've got, mm. we got Champ 2021 coming up right after that. So mm. that's going to be fun too. Awesome. I can't wait. I really can't wait. Now I just we've wanted... got a whole team. I just want to yeah. tell you very quickly about this. Um... And remember, remember, it took four people with a little dog to defeat the Wicked Witch. Oh. <laughs> There's strength in numbers. <laughs> this, we're back in um, Oz again. You know, it's a, the, the thing about that Emerald City is apparently, I don't think those were real emeralds. And that's all part of the trick, isn't it? Part of the, uh, that was just some sort of lime green paint that yep. Cheeky Wizard had painted on that city. Uh, which is primarily cardboard and reinforced plywood, as far as I know. And just talking about that sighting with the boy, uh, where the, the creature tried to get at him in the Orkney Islands. I've just got it here. Um, his name was Alec Groundwater. He was spending the day in Orphia with his family. He doesn't say the year. Throws him some rocks, uh, looking towards Scapa Flow. With his legs dangling out of the water. As the sea beneath him began to boil, and the creature with a broad, flat head. And tusk like teeth lunged at his legs, narrowly missing the boy. As the creature left the scene, he saw it rise above the surface and shake its head and mane, sending water cascading down its body. It might be a walrus for all we know, actually. I but... don't know if you're aware of this, but Scapa Flow is famous for the basking shark sea serpent that washed up there in 1942. Yeah, you mean the Stronzi Beast? Oh, no, the other one, sorry. This is, this is a separate the... case. Yes. So the Stronson was, Beast was 1809. That's right. We're talking about 1942. That's right. I, I've got it here. I've actually well, got please. pictures of the Scapa Flow monster. You do? Mm. Yep. I can wow. get them to you later. If, we, if you them. want me to put together a picture show for this video, I'll slap them on that. Yeah, I think that would be a great idea, actually. Yeah. 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 So there was a carcass discovered on home. The first, that was 24 feet long. And the second was discovered at Scapa, where that was 28 feet long. And they named yep. it Scaposaurus at the time, didn't yeah, they? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. Do a Google um, search for uh, Scapa Flow or Scaposaurus. Yeah. And you should come up with the pictures. It says even the provost, which is like um, a local... Uh, 
the local governor of it in, in Scotland. Uh, <coughs> James Marwick, one lecturer from Durham University, were convinced by the reptilian features of these two carcasses. Mm. Um, and they named it Scaposaurus. Um, okay, right. let's have a look. I mean, they could have been. Uh, Find it? Uh, just, looking, just looking. I found the uh, the sketch of it, the diagram. Hey, you've got it. Okay. There's actually photographs. I haven't found photographs yet, unfortunately. But Who there's a to the Orkney monster? Orkney, I know there's photographs of. That's pretty easy uh, to find. Yeah, I've got the sketches. Well, the sketch looks like a basket yeah. shark. The sketch looks like a basket shark. Yeah. That's one of the biggest... I mean, I've about the, uh, the Zoyamaru carcass a lot recently. And, you know, one of the biggest problems with the Zoyamaru case is the analysis of the sample. Because the way the the chemical with which it was treated, um, what would you say? It it is entirely possible considering the usage of the treatment chemical, uh, which what was it again, Scott? What was it used? It was sodium hypochlorite. Hypochlorite. Right, right. Which which is theorized and and quite reasonably could have degraded the sample to a point where it simply resembled a basking shark sample. Well, um, what, what happened was they did an initial test against the basking shark fibers mm. and found that they were significantly different. Then they thought that, well, okay, the chemical preservative that the Zeomaru fibers were preserved in might have changed the chemistry. So then they took basking shark fibers and treated them with the same chemical mm. and redid the test and they were more similar. Mm, right, right. So they said, well, well, we think that the, the, the chemical differences are because of the chemical preservative. Mm. But that's still, that's doing jiggery-pokery to the analysis. Right, and you have the original um, yeah, you know, the original Japanese documents that are a bit hard to come by, but you can if you dig really hard, that uh, I think were done before that retest was done. And the scientists there said this could very well be a reptile of some kind. Um, so this, uh, it, well, they were the reptile idea on more than just the biochemical analysis. They were basing it on anatomical features. Yes. That, in right. their opinion, did not match up with the shark. Yeah, it's difficult because the more you kind of dig into the analysis that was done anatomically, it's one of those things where you're like, you know, a shark could still explain this, but it is a bit weird that people note certain things. For instance, the fisherman on the actual uh, the fishing trawler uh, noted that it seemed to have red muscle on it. Now, you could argue very easily that, well, you know, there's some red tissue inside of a shark, so it's quite possible they just, you know, meant that there was red tissue. And maybe it was lost in translation, but it would be weird to some degree that fishermen who've undoubtedly pulled up sharks before since there are so many sharks in the world uh would think that that was worth noting mm. you'd think they would have seen that and been like oh yeah it's a shark it has red tissue not well, this is has red muscle on it you know we're doing we're doing a the next episode or the next two episodes of the haunted sea are going to be a long panel discussion between me and carrick and danny b stewart going over all the evidence mm. And basically what I'm trying to say with this whole thing is that nobody is disputing that the great majority of the evidence points toward it being a shark and probably a basking shark. Right. But there were some dissenters, and I don't think it's right to bury their opinions mm -hmm. just because the majority of people think it was a shark. Right. And part of the problem is, is that the creationists ran with the zoo over Maru carcass and kept hammering away with the point that it was proven to be a plesiosaur, which is not exactly the truth. Mm -hmm. And as a result, made any discussion about the subject radioactive because it's mm -hmm. so associated with the creation evolution debate. So what I'm trying to do is take it back to where it originally was and talk about the, the the arguments that it might not have been a shark based on the real evidence. Mm. There were some arguments made based on the original evidence that went against the shark idea. So that's all I'm trying to do. 
And even that's pissing off some people that are adamant that it's nothing but a shark. Shut up about it. We don't want to hear about it. It's, well, I, I see that, and I see that pushback all the time yeah. with this. And so, then once again, what, what the about hell, the ship's know? biologist? You know, what about the, what's his name? Uh, Yoshinori Mizumi. Yeah. Um, and he, what do you say? It's not a fish, whale, or a, any other animal. It's a reptile, and the sketch looks very much like a pleasure. So now I know that was much later in some sort of TV show. It yeah. could have been the translation, but well, essentially he said it. Yeah, you know, and I think that's well, that's Fujio indicative from out of his position. Argued that it, he didn't think it was a fish. Yeah, based on the body proportions, mm. which were based on the measurements that Michihiko Yano, who took the photographs, mm. did on board the ship. Yeah. There's a German documentary that was made in 2006, where they interview Michihiko Yano. He's the guy that photographed it five times mm. and physically examined it, cut the fibers. And measured it. He's a marine biologist. Nine years ship's biologist, after the event, right? he says he didn't think it was a shark. Mm. Twenty-nine mm. years later, so you can't just ignore that. This guy examined this carcass closer than anybody else on board the ship. Mm. The guy's also, a marine biologist. Yes, yeah, so I'm saying, Scott. Also, he was their biologist on that ship. Yes, for that, that, yes. I mean, and and Japanese fish everything. It's not like us. We're not catching cod or tuna yeah. or sea bass or flamber. They catch everything. They're used to everything that's in the sea. And there's exactly. a lot more seafood on their menu. So they would have seen basking and sharks. Fuji they would have seen... was an ichthyologist who was familiar with sharks and other kinds of fish. And he's saying, I don't think this was a fish. Mm. So you can't, just, yes. you can't just ignore this and sweep yeah. it under the table because you want to say, well, oh, it was just a basking shark. And this has absolutely yeah. nothing to do with creation science. Right. It's it's a it's a matter of scientific uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm not they, trying I'm not yeah. trying to pick on the creationists here. I'm just saying no. No. that you can you can argue that this thing was not a shark without putting it through a Bible filter. Right. And I I think the other point on that, on the creationist point, is that the, the the inbuilt prejudice against motive in these in these investigations sometimes is very clear in that its exclusion in today's um well in today's uh, environment and we could almost be primarily based upon its championing by the creationist movement. People say, "Well, well I don't to have anything to problem, do with it. That's a, that's a creationist thing." Part of the problem with the quote creation science movement is you have some real scientifically mm. trained biologists who also happen to be creationists mm -hmm. that argue this stuff and some of their arguments make some sense but then on the other hand you've got creationist um evangelizers yeah. who know nothing about the biology that are out there trying to argue this stuff they right. get it all mangled up. I've seen it. I've seen both and sides. That's part of, of the problem. Yeah. And a lot of the quotes that the evolutionists point to to say to say that, oh, see, these guys are nuts come from the preachers who don't know their ass my on the ground about yeah. biology. And this is a this is an issue, I might point yeah, this out, that is. you have in the US far more than we do over yeah. here. Mm. Because we don't have we don't have religious people so um, entrenched and involved in such subjects. They're well, you know, mainly entrenched and involved in religion. I've and, never been able to understand how you can't reconcile Christianity with evolution. All you got to say is that, well, the book of Genesis is a simplified explanation yeah. of how different kind of animals came along at different periods. And if you accept it from that point of view and don't take it literally word for word, yeah. you can reconcile it. I mean, if you want to, if you want to, you know, uh, I mean, if I'm, you personally, view I'm it, not a religious person, no, absolutely. but if I was, that's how I would reconcile the two. I hmm. think it, if you wanted to, to believe on, on that basis, and, and I know a lot of what they call them theistic evolutionists. I used to be yeah. one myself. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, that's essentially. Exactly the approach I'm talking about. It, I mean, the scripture itself, coming from that basis of studying religion, it doesn't doesn't allow for that kind of interpretation. But nevertheless, 
if I was um, a non-religious person looking at that text, that ancient text, and viewing it just as a, as a creation myth, I would say, well, actually, the days and the order in which all of the things are created as periods of time definitely allow for the order of evolution as it's, as it's proposed yes. to have happened. Actually, yes. you know, because, you know, the animals and the people come last and first you have the fish and they have the birds and everything else comes along. So, I mean, that would it would definitely fit in. I don't know which one would have come first. That's but what yeah. I'm talking about. Yeah, I mean, you know, for anybody. I mean, it's, it's really it's really just being a nitpick and saying, well, if you don't believe exactly that it was created in 24 yes. hours, that's heresy. You know. It's it's a complicated subject, and I, I, I think it's um well, it's not dangerous at all because um you know it's not the kind of religion where we're going to blow you up. But um, at the same time, having studied that for so long, and as I say, being a very, very adamant theistic evolutionist for a long time, and then studying more of the scriptures in university and saying, well, there actually isn't room, especially in the original translations, for that kind of view. Well, yet, however, the um the setup the timeline of the seven days and what's created on each day does fit very easily into it if you want to view it as periods yeah, of see, time. I'm a secular yeah. humanist agnostic. Exactly. exactly. Well, at least I try to understand or, yeah. where they're coming from, you know? Right. Yeah, and you, you make big efforts for that. And I think from my perspective, I've always said that I was accused by a lot of, a few adversaries in the beginning of being a creationist, uh, as if that was a terrible thing. And what I I think I explained in return as was, long as you know, as long as somebody's not trying to ram it down my throat, I can that's, live that's and let live. You know, exactly. I, I feel the same. I have a so, lot of creationist friends, but they know that you know that's not what I am, and we just hmm. don't talk about it. Exactly. Now I don't you mind know? talking about it actually because I think, um, from my perspective anyway, as I was saying my explanation from a cryptozoological point of view is well I'm a religious person so I'm a cryptozoologist who believes in creation but not a creationist cryptozoologist it's not my reason you're not, you're not filtering it. your cryptozoology through creationism well I mean undoubtedly to some point I must be because it's my core belief so I'm sure it affects how I interpret things there's, there's no getting away from that you know yeah. but it's not the aim of my investigation and I yeah. think I'm more interested in these animals that may have existed and still exist, like plesiosaurs, well, or have not do, been categorized like this Sasquatch. discussion mm -hmm. on the Zio Maru carcass, we're going to have to touch on this controversy. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And part of the problem is, is that about a month before the scientific <clears throat> papers on the Zio Maru carcass were published, a guy published an article in a creation science magazine asking about, well, what's the story with this plesiosaur that was found a year ago? Mm -hmm. And part of the problem is the media did not follow up on the scientific results from 1978. Mm. As a result, some of the creationists got it in their head that there was a cover-up going on. Mm. And it wasn't Very a cover-up at all. It's just that <clears throat> scientific papers were not were not reported on in the news media for yeah. whatever reason, which is unfortunate because it could have saved everybody a whole lot of, of grief of arguing over this stuff. Because 1991, a guy published another creation article saying that there was a cover-up that people were trying to bury the story. And that's not true. It's just that the media dropped the ball and didn't report on the 1978 scientific papers. Hmm. And we're going to make that clear in this discussion. I think it right. so, sounds like a great so way to clear the air. Uh, hmm. You know, well, part of this is not the creationist's fault. It's just that they didn't get the whole story <clears throat> and got the wrong idea. Hmm. And this whole misconception has kind of snowballed over the years. Yeah. It's become the official line. And Yeah. Yeah. And the more and that's, that, that the idea is spread that, well, they tried to cover it up. Well, if they tried to cover it up, it must have really been a plagiarism. You see the logic there? Mm. It happens all the time. Carrick, you, re you reported on my recent um, 
um, misidentification as a Sasquatch. Yes, I, I've been reading yeah. your book, Lisa Britton, which I would recommend, by the way. I just oh, finished it you. last week. It's a great book. Oh, and, wow. Okay. Yeah, well, I'd never read uh, British Cutters of literature before, so that was really interesting. And, well, it's a uh, great book because I'm in it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I, I was reading, and it's funny, I had just finished the segment on the Box Hill Ape maybe uh, a week before I saw this article, and someone posted to my Facebook group the yeah. first line of the article, and it was, uh, Andy McGrath was, you know, uh, uh, jogging uh, down Box Hill. That was the first saw, giveaway that it wasn't me. <laughs> and, and instantly I was like, that didn't happen. So I, I shot you a message instantly. Uh, I commented with the person. I put together a little image of my my own interpretation, yeah. we'll say, of the Box Hill Ape sighting. I loved it. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I, I try my best to kind of make things um, visually represented well, which, um, but yeah, picture, you know. The picture stuff. was of Box Hill, though. That's a little gate that leads out to one of the main paths there. Mm. So you used the Box Hill picture as well. I noticed that. I did, yeah. I tried to find a good image that I could use with the, uh, you know, the primate model that I had found. I walked through that gate so many times. Oh, I bet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember the book in the the book has the photo of those very yes, steps of the steps. Yeah. But yeah. yeah, was and of course you were reporting that sighting. You yourself hadn't had the sighting. No. And um, you know that's pretty evident because you put the sighting in quotes in the in the book. <laughs> so I think that the whole complex issue of the Zoya Maru carcass and something as small yeah. as that article mm. are part of like the uh, the villainous nature. Maybe not through intent, but through cause um, of misinformation. Because yeah. let's say neither you or I had ever seen the article that got posted. Those mm -hmm. posts can have upwards of 500 reaches sometimes. That would have been 500 people who've probably never heard of the Box Hill 8 because it's a lesser known case in the U.S. Yeah. And, um, you know, most of the group's people are, are from the U.S. So as far as I'm concerned, that's, you know really easy to get wrong to it some was, people it was very easy but also it went in so there's a, a journalist in the daily star which is like a very tabloid british newspaper but he's he, i've been passing him a few stories from the book he's a nice guy and he more or less sticks to the story and just frames it in a sort of you know a nice punchy sort of way that newspaper readers would like to read but it's still the story right. he publishes the box hill ape and it's one of a few stories i've sent to him and immediately afterwards, it gets Surrey. Now, Surrey is the area that I'm in, the, the county of Surrey, which is just outside of London. It gets Surrey magazine, picks it up because it's in Surrey, mm -hmm. and basically makes me the witness. I don't know how they could have read it that way. The Daily Star is very clear, and the second one isn't clear. Now, the Daily Star article had 200,000 hits, I think, on right. Right. Facebook and, uh, and uh, other places. They get Surrey, which is a tiny, tiny, that Daily Star is a national newspaper. This is a tiny, tiny little um, online newspaper and a little sort of rank that goes out every two weeks. That's the one I, I just noticed was being passed all around the Internet, even though the other one was hit on much more and much more prominent. That's the one that sold because that was a sens sensational story. This guy who's looking for it also saw it and he's claiming to have this crazy sighting. Of course, the comments were insane as they would be underneath and um and people were contacting me like you're insane so what's this and other researchers were saying why are you, why are you claiming this you know mm. we know you this is not your sighting right. and uh well, I said, well, it's, it's i'm not claiming anything <laughs> they're claiming it but then it became immediately clear to me the sensational is more interesting. Just the metered story of what happened, my investigation of the area, is not as interesting as the fact that maybe I was there and I saw it. And mm. suddenly, isn't that really interesting, like the Zio Morrow thing? And here it is. The place you saw cover up from the creationist. Exactly. The guy who claims Bigfoot exists or is searching for him happens accidentally to see him. Oh, what a lucky coincidence. Mm. And that's more of a story. And on we go. And maybe, you know, maybe it will stay the official line in future. Right. Who knows? Well, hopefully it doesn't. Yeah, I, I yeah, think that has a good yeah. point with the way forward, partially at least, is to correct that which has been gotten wrong, yeah. as well as, as to expand the actual database. We need to also correct the incorrect data. And, um, you know, yeah. Kurtis field where narrative is data, which is really interesting. You know, that's, mm -hmm. a, that's not a thing we encounter a lot in science, yeah. but it is. You know, narrative is a big part of our data. 
So that's um, that's very interesting in that regard, and it's certainly a thing we need to keep an eye out for because it happens so so easily. And I know I've been uh, misguided on that before. So um, yeah, that was really uh, an interesting experience with that for sure, and relates a lot to what we're talking about here. Absolutely. And you have to think the misconceptions about the Zuya Maru carcass have been rolling around for over forty years. Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah, they're the common knowledge, Then they have been for decades. Yeah. yeah. And it's and, tradition uh, now. It's the traditional version of the story. It's within your your muscle memory, almost. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But when you, Scott confronts people on this upcoming podcast with the truth about the situation, they're going to have to go through a barrier to accept that. Well, actually, no, I, I heard about this story years ago. You're wrong. Actually, what happened is, and then they repeat... The, well, uh, you got the you got line. one group of people standing on one side of the room yelling, "Well, it was proven to be a basking shark," and then mm-hmm. the, the people on the other side of the room saying, "No, it was proven to be a plesiosaur." Mm-hmm. Right. The truth is somewhere in between those two extremes, yeah. much closer to the basking shark argument, but that's not exactly the whole truth. Right. Well, it, it that's comes what down we're to trying to straighten it out, you know. Yeah. Well, you know, it comes down a bit, I think, to uh, to what would you say? I think part of taking on the responsibility of not letting yourself be one of the devices by which that kind of misconstruction occurs is something that I think, Andy, you and I talked about the mm-hmm. last time I was on the podcast, which was you have to recall that you're human. And so chances are you're dead wrong on something. Yeah. Um, because you know it's it's just so hard to uh, to really get the full picture because we're we're not always particularly as investigative as we could be. Mm-hmm. So to um, to one thing, assume that you must be right is uh, probably not a good idea. And then I think a worse idea is probably to state your point without actually. Um, like what Scott says is a great point because the thing about that isn't just the yelling it's neither side is saying it was a basking shark and here's why or it was mm. a plesiosaur and here's why just it was yeah. a basking shark no it was a plesiosaur that's now, a circular argument yeah, that goes exactly. on forever it's gone on for 40 years and it will keep going mm-hmm. that is yeah. not a thing that stops and uh, so to at least explain yourself <laughs> is probably a good idea because yeah, people it's choose camp it's going to take all four hours for us to sit down and hash through all this, but it will be worth it. I, Scott, I think it's it's a great thing that you're doing there because essentially what you're facing is it's 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 tribal, it's almost religious, like cryptozoology mm. interest well, yeah. could be many many times. Something that's come up to me recently, cryptozoology, is, and I have a friend that sends me all of these mad posts of um, special chosenness with Sasquatch visitations on some of these sites recently. And, you know, it's always lacking in evidence. It's always, um, well, what did I say to him? Somebody once again said, there's a, there's a new (laughs) stick structure, like a nest made that was made at the bottom of my garden. And did you know that they, they can now imitate the sound of jingle bells, like, like my doorbell has. And, um, I heard it the other day, and one left a, an acorn in my pocket. And I said to him, you know, what's astonishing to me about these people is it has all of the elements of religious mania involved in it. Mm. You are a chosen one that this higher being has chosen to interact with, and only you can perceive the evidence. And when anybody questions it, you are enraged because your core religious beliefs have been um, doubted. Exactly. That's what and, you call a true believer in cryptozoology. That's right. That's right. That's and this is where you are with these things, because essentially, even the Baskin shark guys, I noticed they're just as um, they're just as aggressive in their presentation of what it is. Because if you don't yep. believe, here's the evidence. And if you don't believe what it is, what I'm saying, you must just be stupid or a creationist or this or that. That's, yep. you know, a denigrating uh, it, 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 the, the other stupid category that doesn't belong in science wow. where we are on the right side you know, of everything that's when you here. get confronted by somebody that just flat out tells you you're wrong yeah but they won't explain why you're wrong they yeah. just tell you you're wrong period that's yeah. it yeah. end yeah. of end of argument yeah it's yeah. sad too because i think people are are uh right now in the field kind of expectant for that to be the discussion one thing I've noticed a lot on my channel that I've had the pleasure of, of interacting with more than, than um, 
just a base level, is people will make a point in a comment of a video, and it's not one that's explained, and it isn't one that seems to have room for disagreement. Um, you know, it's it's pretty flat out opinionated most of the time. But what I enjoy doing is is talking to that person and saying, well, why do you think that? And what I find happens maybe 75% of the time is immediately a guard comes down mm -hmm. and they're like, oh, this person actually wants to talk with me. And, you know, that's great and sad at the same time. It's great because a lot of people are willing to talk. It's sad because they're conditioned to not expect to talk. Well, that's, um, but that's that's the, the the environment in which we all live now. It's right. tribal. It's um, it's uh, you you your intention in in your comments is to to burn the other person, not to make a point. Usually, I, I used to I used to have until nice people actually started commenting on my channel. I used to say this, and I don't say it anymore. And that is only that only sees comment. It's a alliteration. It rhymes. Um, let's just see two stars <laughs> to yes. So only and because generally everybody who commented on my channel said something at the beginning just like that, which just to say, take that feeling rough today. I'm going to give you that. What are you going to do about it? Right. And then I used to come back and, you know, uh, give them a little bite back. And eventually something similar happened. I thought, well, actually, yeah, if you are so what their evidence is and you, you would have, be happy to discover it. Uh, they at least try to give it to you, or they just back away. Yeah, right. Uh, even if they're still insulting, there's one more, and then they go. They don't come back again, because yeah, if you I have mean, nothing, you don't front. Right. And if you do, you're willing to discuss it. Right. Right. Yeah, I think that that's one great thing about having. Um, that's one thing Alexander uh, Pitikoff noted recently in a comeback as I was with him. It's great that it seems like a lot of the newer people in cryptozoology mm -hmm. get along really well with yeah. not only themselves but with most of the people who've been in it for a while too most people scott's met in the field that are newer get along with him great i get along with andy great like you know it's it's a really nice interconnectedness that i don't think the field has seen yet really yeah. and uh that's a pretty spectacular thing that's really special and i don't uh, want to take that for granted <laughs> no but nice I, I think to see yeah. some of the younger people coming up doing deeper analysis than some mm. of the people in the past have done yeah, that's a fact. That's a fact. Yeah. That's, that's, that's noticeable. That's the new guy. Is intense scrutiny from all angles. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. The angles that you don't necessarily agree with, you you need to explore those as well. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah, yeah, I think that's um that's a very good point. I, I've noticed that. <clears throat> they patting each other on the back here, but I've definitely noticed that with yourselves. Alex, mm -hmm. you, um, Eli, everybody else involved, Nash, and people are just, yeah, they're just open to finding out what's going on. Scott's always right. been that way, and Scott, from the, the moment we first met, you know, and like a lot of uh, the other people I was trying to get in touch with, when I said, okay, let's try and make a thing of this, let's at least try to be serious about it, a few mm -hmm. years ago, Scott was like, here's all this information that might help you. Yeah. <laughs> And yeah. just take all of that and use it any way you want. And if you mention me, that's cool. And if you don't, that's cool. Mm. Um, message me if you've got any questions. I was like, wow, okay. So now I know everything about lake monsters. <laughs> because God <laughs> told me. And she, but shared the information you collected. And that's, you know, that's a great thing. That's the way everything should be, really. Because it's a small, tiny, vilified, mocked genre. If we can't be friends with each other. We've got no friends anyway. Well, yeah, we we all have enemies. Yeah, yeah, that's just absolutely. Part of the territory. That's the downside of cryptozoology. But I think it's changing. That's what I think. And I hope just, so. Yeah, I think I so. It so would be so. nice. It would be nice. Yeah, it, would be. it seems like the direction things are moving is um, when enemies get made, it's a quick affair with the people who are kind of the most prevalent and uh it's over in about two months and it's um it's it's left in dust after that 
And hopefully that's the way it stays. Hopefully yeah. those are things that don't continue to impede the field for decades like they did when Lauren Coleman was big on the scene or when Lon yeah. Strickler was younger and things like that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's, there's beef that those guys have witnessed over the years, it would, maybe with themselves at points, but with, within these circles. I mean, the, what's that great book that um, uh, Paul, no, it's not Paul Bartholomew, who wrote it, Scott? The Champ Book? Yes. Robert, his brother. Robert, Robert wrote it. Okay. The, the, the story of Champ, right? It's, um, I've got it, actually, I've read it a few times. But you're mentioned in there, and all of the, all of the, the, the vested interests and the fights and the squabbles and the ulterior motives of everybody at that time who was involved in Champ Research are laid bare in the book. Yep. And I thought, this is amazing. This is a book that really just tells it how it is. And after having like having had two really rough first two years in the genre and I decided to do it, I thought, yeah, this is exactly what it's like. And why is it like this? Um, isn't it great that he's written about this very bravely? He must have known mm. some of these people. Uh, you would know more about that, Scott. And yet I had to face them afterwards and say, yeah, I, I well, told everybody what you like. The cool thing <laughs> is I came out relatively unscathed. Well, you did. Yeah. Uh, you were even <laughs> thanked. You were thanked in the um, yeah, in the um, in the notice that they the. But look, I, I think it's it's a wonderful genre, and it is full of mystery and wonder, and lots of fun to be had if people just view it that way and not as some territory or um, mm. something. You know, I, if they are really undiscovered animals like the ones we're searching for either they don't belong to people or an individual yeah. neither yeah. does an area um well that's why i freely share my information because yeah. it's not about me it's about the evidence right yeah exactly exactly well guys i think we've we've talked ourselves that we're on an hour and a half um i could i could definitely go all night but um I, I suppose those two children will be waking me around about 6 a.m. Uh, <laughs> yep. I should maybe get some soup. Wishing you both a very, very uh, Merry Christmas. You know, and I hope Same that... Same to you. Yeah, Same to you. I hope that you happy yield New results. Year. Yeah, Happy New Year. Um, happy New Year. And everything else. Happy, happy Festivus. Happy <laughs> My Christmas is coming late. It arrives January 20th at noon. Oh, yeah. That's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's not get into that one. Oh gosh, we've got another hour and a half. Okay. <laughs> Let's press record again. Chink. <laughs> Look, I um no, I don't have anything to say about it. It's not my country, it's not my business. <laughs> That's been my opinion all the way through. And I've got my own dictator here to deal with. Yeah, anyway. Boris. My you know, that 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 lovable, affable, blabbering Viking who we thought was so wonderful, who was an excellent amazing mayor of london who's turned into a dictator uh, in in the you know the, the uh in the shortest way possible to explain it well, we cannot at least leave Hitler london there is an orange yeah i you know what blonde orange you know uh, demented and 47 years in politics they're all the same face to me <laughs> um i don't think Billy Connolly used to say that the desire to become a politician should invalidate you from ever being one. People should be should be selected automatically based upon ability. <laughs> and you shouldn't be allowed to be one if you wanted to be one. <laughs> yeah. um, and I think that's some that's that's good advice. Listen, guys, Merry Christmas to you both. Happy New Year and um Yeah. Greet you soon. Yep. Bye. Bye.